what about gender? I will, I will discuss gender a little later because I would like to read to you a letter that uh, my wife and I wrote uh, uh, in regard to these issues. But for now, just keeping this in mind, the term gender is much more connected to sex than some people would like to believe. And this is the issue. In order to understand the complexity and even more so the relation between biology and etymology or between psychology and sociology, between neuroscience and endocrinology, between history, historicity, and politics, you better know more. In other words, if you only know one language and this language has nothing to do uh, with the etymology itself, well, you can normally claims in an area where you don't have any expertise in. So the least the person can do is have a very solid knowledge of, that would be the bare minimum, of the etymology of the standard languages from which the current one you want to use originate. Now, in the context of English, we could say that, you know, English, American English, it's to some extent an evolution. I'm not going to say whether, you know, positive or negative, but it's a, a, it's a, a divergent morphing mechanism from British English. And British English is an evolution or devolution from German, we could say. Um, although, you know, this will be misrepresentative of the... Uh, the Britonic component, the Celtic component, the Anglo-Saxon as opposed to modern German component, and the very fact that modern German has much of our influence from, from, from French in comparison to other Germanic languages. Think about Icelandic, for instance, uh, uh, or even Norwegian, okay, Danish and Swedish. But in any case, the ver at the very least, you should have a solid understanding of the Germanic component of English if you want to use gender in English. But because of the complexity of English language and the very fact that English was extremely influenced by Italic language, more specifically by Romance language, even more specific by Latin and filtered through French, you better learn your Latin and possibly you should also learn a bit of Greek. If you don't master at least these four or five languages, any discussion about what gender or sex mean, you should really leave it to the experts. Okay? And this is one of the issues uh, that I always say because... Um, very often people, um, and just put everybody in the same basket, me included, people struggle with feeling appreciated. Um, and, and then it can be traumatic because nobody well, likes to be transparent. The research is pretty clear. Um, think about the research done in, in uh, developmental and child psychology, where um, if you had to put um, all children in, in a classroom to three groups, assuming there's three groups, can be somewhat artificially separated be between the child who gets all the attention, it's the teacher's pet, or just the, 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 the child that everybody wants to play with, the, the, the star of the classroom. Uh, the second group is the child um, that is um, neither appreciated nor appreciated, it's kind of transparent, you know, it's like average. And the third uh, group where you find a child that is hated, quote unquote, by everybody, you'll find that the research clearly indicates that in general, in terms of modulating self-esteem, the first one at first will be the one that will have much better scores of self-satisfaction, happiness, and feeling content at first, because this can be addictive as many, many uh, stories, unfortunately, uh, will lead us to believe in, in the science backs up these stories, of course. Uh, you know, being constantly um, under the spotlight, being constantly appreciated, it's in itself uh, very addictive. And so if you grow up and you don't have the same appreciation, for instance, if you don't perform as well, academically speaking, as you did you know, in elementary school, then this could create a problem. But at first, while you're having this nurturing behavior from others, it makes a person feel good. The last two groups, the one that is neither super you know, loved nor super hated, and the one that's super hated, interestingly enough, the one that is actually more quote unquote hated scores much better than the one that's neither or. Why is the case? Because being hated, it's not as bad as not being anybody. Of course, it's a negative form of attention, but it's nevertheless an attention. And at this point, since I cannot get in the first group, I'm much rather being remembered by something bad rather than not being remembered at all, I've been completely see-through. Okay, so we, we have this need of being appreciated, to, to be existing, to be present. And so 
when we're talking about this lack of knowledge, then unfortunately, um, it's more and more prevalent. This lack of knowledge makes the person not just mistaken, especially in the context of sex and gender, but just um, arrogant uh, because of the lack of knowledge. And uh, this is something that we should dedicate some time, but um, I want to give a general um, overview, which we'll be you know, further discussing in the letter that we'll read to you later. So uh, not always appealing to the principle of authority is the right thing to do. In other words, think about the peer review process. You should not, as a reviewer, just read the name of the person who wrote the, the, the paper. In fact, if you are scientifically honest and you know the person, you should not be able to review the paper because you have, um, you, you you might be biased in your in your judgment. So you should disclose if you ever work with a scientist or if you have any other connection with a scientist or if you have any any other disclosure uh, to, uh, to to share with the with the board. And so you should not appeal to authority because the research speaks for itself, regardless of how famous or authoritative the person is. With some exception, example, um, if um, an, an example that I give all the time, if um, someone like me, okay, with, with I would say an, an average good knowledge of neuroscience, neurobiology, psychiatry, psychology, uh, has to undergo an open heart surgery, despite of the fact that I might be better than the average person in reading and understanding the scientific literature in that area, I have no expertise whatsoever in comparison to a uh, cardiothoracic surgeon. So if I'm going for a surgery, I need to trust the authority of the person because I lack the necessary knowledge to tell the person what to do. I should not expect myself to tell the other person what to do because I don't know. It's not my field. It's not my area of expertise. Okay? And of course, being an expert, as I mentioned multiple times, is, is to have the expertise, but also to make the experience, to have a practical knowledge. And of course, within that, we have to understand if this, this experience is properly applied with with. with um, effectiveness, efficiency, efficacy, those are very distinct things. But the point I'm trying to make is that you need to trust. And that's what you need to do in science in general. So again, putting things together serves the political agenda of some, but science is a completely different thing. So putting in the same basket, I don't know, um, pandemics uh, or claims of pandemic hoax and other conspiracy theory, um, global war make, transgender issues, mixing and matching all together simply shows an uh, ignorance of the field. And you just need to admit the fact that you or another person might be ignoring some elements so you can trust the authority of people that know more than you do. Uh, another, another example I make all the time is, all right, so you just mentioned experience. Does that mean that a person needs to know everything about you and needs to undergo everything you do to be able to tell you something? Absolutely not. This is a claim that's done actually more on the left side of the political spectrum where um, that I witness all the time, both in, 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 in pseudo-scientific claims within clinical psychology or psychiatry as well in the public discourse. The fact that uh, you as a doctor should not tell me how should I feel about my body. You should not put a label on me um, beside those biological labels. And even that are on shaky grounds, unfortunately, with this kind of postmodernist uh, reality rejection um, um, curve that we're witnessing. But you should not tell me that I have a um, gender dysphoria or a, a gender identity disorder. It's not a disorder. I'm on a spectrum. You should not tell me because you're not me. You don't know who I am. You don't know what it feels, what it means to be me in my body. All right. Now we need to separate um, mistaken attacks as in things that are perceived as such from true science. Example, if I were, and this is an example I use all the time, if I were to go Again, uh, in the operating room, unfortunately, in this example, I'm not, I'm not doing too well. Bear with me. Uh, to operate, to get surgery and operation on my knee, right? I won't expect the surgeon, the doctor, to have the exact same problem in her knee, his knee, right? 
I trust the fact that he or she went to medical school and knows what he or she is doing, right? So if they're telling me, well, your, your body, that specific part of your body, in this case, your knee has an issue, I will not be so arrogant and ignorant to say, well, you don't know anything about what it means to have my knee in my body, and therefore you don't tell me what to do. No, I should trust the fact that they definitely know more about me than myself. That's the bottom line. And it's the bottom line because um, this is even more so when we're talking about intersection between mind and body, which is the field we're talking about here. When we talk about identity, when we're talking about gender, we're talking about the interconnectivity uh, element, uh, at least between bodily element, between um, physical and metaphysical element, between mind and physical body, between psychological processes and endocrine, neurological, biological processes. Okay, It's even more important. The fact that I, I give a um, diagnosis, I label it to a patient, does not mean that I'm, that I'm criticizing the patient or putting the patient down. It simply means I'm doing my job right. And this is an issue because uh, uh, we are mistaking help with partial, how can I say this? Uh, partial um, partial satisfaction, which is interesting because that's what we just talked about. Gender dysphoria is dissatisfaction. So if I can see something within you that you don't see yourself or you don't see yourself yet, because that's what research clearly indicates, you should not interpret this as me trying to take away your sense of self, your identity, or tell you what to do. I'm helping you because I actually am in a position to know more about yourself, given the, the, the developing patterns, than you might know at this point. A classical example is suicidality. If I have to be honest with patients that come to me and they present with either suicidal ideation or um, you know, suicidality in general with possible rehearsal and plan, then if I want to apply the same cognitive process to what we just said, I would say I have no right to tell you not to harm yourself. I have no right to tell you not to kill yourself. I have no right to tell you how you should feel about yourself because I'm not you. I shouldn't pontificate about the way you feel. And yet it is my ethical role and my scientific role to tell you the truth, which is a universally valid truth. Namely, that things can get better and you might not see the future. Now, I completely understand that this is a very complex issue, and it should has to do with advanced directives, with end-of-life care, with levels of cognitive uh, capacity, capability, ability. Um, and, and so I will not make necessarily a claim for all of the presentation that might lead to physical death. Example, I might not make the claim that a person uh, should just deal with their physical or emotional pain, and it should be completely callous and emotionally detached, saying, well, uh, you just need to deal with your pain. I, I cannot help you here. Okay, This is a completely, completely different um, approach to this. But I also know based on science, my clinical expertise, and what the peer review research mechanism clearly identifies as true, again, as true, I can claim, rightfully so, that things can get better. And the fact that you are not recognizing that has nothing to do with me trying to brainwash you and to believe something else, or even worse, trying to brainwash you to believe that you're something different. It has to do with the fact that if you give, I would even say, if you give time the time, although in many cases, the natural occurring process actually helps monitoring that. And this is true for rapid onset, by the way then you should trust me and my expertise. In any case, we are united front. The idea of reverse victimism is what really makes the problem be uh, magnifying in its nature and, um, and value. So what, what does that mean in practice? Uh, it means that, um, going back to what we said about um, um, this, this re reverse opposite oxymoron-based um, pseudo tolerance i'm pushing away the very hell that could make me feel better and in this sense i could also make this claim that um transgender ideology could be viewed actually as a right-wing ideology not a left-wing one now of course i'm always using these terms in the way i use it since the beginning of this lecture which is 
just to stimulate a uh, cognitive process. I don't like to put people in categories. But to what extent transgender ideologies are right-wing ideology? Well, it's predicated upon an exclusive extremist idealization of individualism. To some extent, you can make the exact same claim and obtain opposite results. Think about terms such as my body, my choice. In the United States currently, modern times, if you use my body, my choice in the context of reproductive health, usually that means that the person is overall uh, in support of free access to abortion measures. My body, my choice. You don't tell me what to do with my body. However, if we're talking about the recent pandemic, COVID-19, my body, my choice could mean a very different things. Don't tell me what vaccine I should or should not take because the body is mine. What I'm trying to say is this, science cannot be summed up in a um, bumper sticker or in a tweet okay, on Twitter. Science is much more complex. And if you don't have the decency to study at least all of these areas, so endocrinology, neurology, evolutionary biology, or, or any type of biology at this point, human growth and development, some basic element of etymology, historicity, historical criticism, uh, archaeology, anthropology, that you cannot make the claim that you know what you're talking about. You need to study more. Now, you might also make this say, okay, so it's, it's a right wing ideology because, because it's, it's, it's um, uh, individualistic. Well, that's really a dubious claim. Well, there are other elements as to why uh, you know, we might interpret transgender ideology as a right wing ideology. Another claim is that um, my understanding of the world should be the understanding of the world everywhere else. And this right wing as in it's a supremacist ideology. As in, if you think differently than me, despite the fact that science clearly doesn't agree with me, I'm sorry to say that, then you are a supremacist um, member of the hierarchy that wants to demolish the freedom I have to, uh, to speak up for myself. A classical example is the, again, we could see this from the rhyming perspective, going to a different culture and different country and claim that what we perceive as, I don't know, repressive as to traditionalists or the opposite has to be considered backwards, repressive, negative, and hateful because it doesn't align with the values we have here in the United States, for instance. There are plenty of examples here. One example that on top of my mind is thinking about the, um, I don't know, the, the, the shadow or the burqa, the, the, the veil that, you know, some, some culture, some ethno-religious group have, you know, um, traditional Catholics, uh, Muslims, etc. The, the veil that you you put on, um, and 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 this would be a a mis misconstruction of what our values are, as if our values are the only values, and if people don't agree with our values, means that they didn't quite get it. They're not as evolved as we are in the West. That would be a right wing thing to say. On top of the fact that this. Extre extreme focus on myself as opposed to any type of um, societal norm, it's in itself right wing. If you can make a historical criticism is that certain ideologies on the left wing or perceived left wing political spectrum, such as socialism and communism, as the names imply, are focused on groupthink as a community, communist or society, socialism where you could make the argument that the individual is not as meaningful. And yet, in the context of transgender ideology, doesn't matter what the community says, unless it's a community that I artificially create to feed my ideals that are entirely subjective. So in this sense, transgender ideology could be viewed as a um, right-wing ideology. On top of that, you have a lot, a lot of other things that are entirely predicated on, on extreme and ethical capitalism, especially in the context of quote unquote unquote gender reassignment surgeries and the pharmacological intervention starting with hormone therapy that unfortunately are yet again an indication of the overpowering structure of big pharma, especially in the United States. But you don't have to go into the level of, I would say, Bohr's conspiracy theory to see how that is a problem. Now, of course, 
it doesn't matter whether we uh, identify transgender ideologies left wing or right wing. The problem with ideologies is that they're not representative of the truth. So we're going back to gender. Okay? Let's start with a bit of, uh, how can I say, uh, overall etymological considerations, and then we will delve into that. Well, in terms of the word itself, it's really, really close to sex. Okay, And you might make the claim that, well, well, who cares about etymology? What matters is the way we use words nowadays. Fair enough. And I have a, an argument against that claim. First of all, this argument is, again, a false assumption, which is in itself predicated upon extreme left versus right political uh, understanding of reality, where overall, I'm making a big assumption here, overall, uh, left wingers, um, you can put, you know, it's a very big, big umbrella. We'll put in this context, um, progressive, okay, uh, political spectrum uh, is obsessed with the future, as the name implies, progress, where traditionalist conservatives, right wing, are obsessed about the past. What does it mean? Well, if you if you actually look at life as a real spectrum, as a circle, I would say the two extremes eventually meet, okay? Because what happens in the context of right-wing traditionalists, the, the logical fallacy is easy to determine. If you call yourself a traditionalist, well, at what point in time in the past you think we should attribute the quote-unquote golden era, the golden age of reality? Because you can always go further back in time. Example, if we're talking about gender issues, should we go back to 50 years ago, 10 years ago? Should we go back to the DSM-4, 3, 2, 1? Should we go back and look at um, um, homosexual behavior as opposed to orientation as a pathology? Should we go further back in time and find some dubious, to put it mildly, really anti-scientific and hateful uh, claims on uh, racial hierarchies, which we would love to think about as like this is thing of the past 150 years ago, um, uh, revolution age, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, but the truth is that in this country and many other countries, Europe, including in Scandinavia, which at least on paper looks like a very open minded, inclusive uh, culture, um, we have eugenic practices until the very recent time, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and so we have to be careful about looking at all those other things in the past. Those things are not relegated in the past. They could surface nowadays and it could surface tomorrow. Okay, what about, okay, maybe, maybe 150 years ago, it's not enough. We should really go back to at least 400, 500 years ago. All right, well, 400, 500 years ago, uh, you might still have only the three biggest American cities. Uh, so none of which are in the United States. So it doesn't mean that nothing happened in the United States uh, um, is of any historical relevance. And the only country that, that has some relevance is the country where the biggest North American uh, city is, namely Mexico City and everything else doesn't matter. Well, we should go back to the Roman Empire. Maybe we should go back to and so on and so forth. So the point is that you have to decide where you draw the line. Also, because the further back you go, the less knowledge you might have to some extent, because the assumption that the history was written 4,000 years ago, it's less precise than the history was written 10 years ago. It's also a modernist assumption, a, an assumption predicated upon uh, misappropriation of uh, uh, enlightenment ideas. But the same issues is on the opposite side of the political spectrum, progressives, the idea that something is intrinsically good just because it is new. Example, computers, I would say. Now, without sounding uh, really um, uh, intolerant, backward, and obscurant, is there are a lot of things about computers and the internet that, of course, are beneficial to knowledge. But as I just mentioned, I can make this claim that overall, the current state of higher education, at least in the United States, it's much, much, much worse than it used to be before the internet. Now, I don't attribute the, to the internet or to the development of, of informatics and computer science a causal reason for what is the case, but you could make the claim that 
the more you rely on external memories, the less prone you are to remember things. The more you rely on typing things, the less prone you are to remember how to spell things. And by the way, there's plenty of research that clearly indicates that. Now, should we go back to Akkadian time and having our, you know, a uh, piece of, of clay or wood up on to write? Maybe not all the time, but having some experience with calligraphy actually could make a huge difference. At least it will give you the chance to be more humble about the fact you have no clue whatsoever about what gender actually means. So gender, um, some etymology correlates. And again, there are intrinsically valid because you, you can monitor over time with some basic linguistics, okay? The fact that a term has been utilized since time immemorial, it's not necessarily the only um, measure of the validity of this term. In other words, just because something is old, it doesn't make it true, right? Or just because something is new, it doesn't make it true either. But the fact that there are similarities in the usage across time and space throughout culture gives us the, the general idea that this is very similar across time to a commonality of meaning especially if we're talking about old etymology, I would say Indo-European etymology. And we could make the same claim for um, Ugrophinic uh, or Samoyed um, languages, you know, Tibetan languages, um, Semitic languages, and so on and so forth. So not something that's old, like 400 years old, because that's also a, a misconception. The fact that uh, something that's very, very old is less good in comparison to something that's slightly old, for instance. Um, think about um, how uh, the, the very conceptualization of, of ethics switch over time, but we cannot claim that ethics is something that evolves either. Evolves as in changes, sure, but we could make the claim that in terms of the ethics of the 1930s in Germany, for instance, were definitely much, much inferior than the ethics of the Austro-Hungarian Empire for the first 500 years. So, there's no evolution in that sense whatsoever. We don't seem to learn from that. And that's also a problem because we're we're mixing and matching some historical or historicity-based um, philosophical standpoints. Think about Marxism and your Marxism and related elements. Think about the Frankfurt School. Think about uh, postmodernism, where in, in, in the former, you have an extreme obsession with history as if history always tells us more as we knew last yesterday than we know today, or the opposite, that nothing is um, absolute and there's no truth to begin with. In any case, um, if you think about the term gender, sure, we could start from the grammar casus, okay? So the grammar equivalent of sex. And, you know, you don't need to be a very uh, knowledgeable linguist to know that there are languages where you have no genders whatsoever, languages have two genders, male and female, uh, languages that have either a full or partial third gender, it or is, for instance, in German or Latin, uh, languages that have singular, plural, and dual, and many, many others, different ways to uh, count, base 20, base 10. There's a, a whole lot of variation, and not always the expected sex of an object is reflective of the biological sex, especially in inanimated objects. You know, why does that to be just out, for instance? Or the fact in certain dialects you can transfer the uh, grammar gender, depending if you want to make the word sound more, I don't know, cute or little, or it's predicated upon the uh, localization geocultural element upon which the dial is based. Think about, in my case, from, from Tyrol, if you think about Tyrolean dialects, including South Tyrolean, which are related to Bavarian dialect, you can say, for instance, Mad, okay, um, for, or, or even Metian in Central German, you know, you don't have to think of, 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 uh, of a girl as in a female, grammarly speaking, gender, because you can use the neutral to convey exactly the same term. In any case, gender is in itself also related to genus, genus, gens, okay? So from, from one area, entirely biologically based. That is the etymology of gens or gens in, in Latin, okay? Which is kind of interesting because... Uh, <laughs> That is the etymology of gentile and gentle, because the assumption is that the gentiles are the chosen one, which is actually the opposite from the perspective of, of biblical uh, knowledge or biblical, uh, let's say, historical interpretation, where um, the, the, the gentiles are, are the goyim, not the chosen ones, so to speak. But from the Latin perspective, since the gens has to do with the genus, the genetic, the generativity, the creation, the biology, 
the gens were the chosen one as in the families that belong to that the part of Alba Longa, eventually Rome and the, the Lapium part of Italy. Uh, gens is also related to the creativity as in creation itself. Think about uh, gynos, gynecology. Uh, think about uh, Slavic languages. So this is true throughout the, the, the level of, of uh, at least Indo-European languages. I can mention something about Sino-Tibetan and um and um, semitic languages as well uh, but think about you know bosnian or russian jena for instance for, for for feminine and many many others so to completely separate gender from sex is simply an indication that um, you don't really know what are you talking about in this context now does that mean that we should just say and use the words the way that are being used for the last two thousand years not necessarily, but A, if you do it, you have a very you need to have a very solid reason to change what the common user term has been for the last 2000 years. You can just make stuff up, okay? You cannot make pronouns up because that's not how language evolves. It's nothing to do with the repressive hierarchy that wants to take away your right away. Again, sounds right wing. It has nothing to do with a manifestation of your identity as a way to fight against a world that doesn't want to accept uh, how you are. It simply has to do with the fact that things are predicated upon solid manifestation in reality. But anyway, if you can make this claim that uh, gender is completely unrelated to, uh, to sex, we can find a common ground and say, well, how about we talk about gender identity rather than just gender or gender manifestation or all the above, gender behavior, gender um, perception, okay? Well, this will be not too different from a biological standpoint, and as you can see from a philosophical standpoint as well, then claiming that genotype and phenotype are not always the same. The external manifestation of something is not the same. And yet again, this is another proof that there is some element of um, right-wing perception in gender ideology. Now, I want to, to clarify things here. The reason why I keep insisting on the fact that transgender ideologies are right-wing ideology, it's not because I believe to be true. Ideologies are ideologies, and I don't really care if they're left or right, but I just want to clarify how many of these terms are usually used by the left political spectrum to defend transgender ideology without realizing that the thing they're very that they are defending is actually opposite to the values that they claim or that they think they are uh, defending. Okay. So um if if it is true that um, you you can you can have a, a different version of, of of gender that is separated from sexuality, then you can say that there is a difference between genotype and phenotype as it should. We talked about all the you know DSDs, and there's a difference throughout uh, medical knowledge. The, the way you appear, it's not necessarily the way your uh, genetic heritage is. Okay. Think about all the research on, on cardiovascular disease, for instance. But again, this is a problem that really is similar to certain traditionalist element that want men, again, male side to always look and behave a certain way, as opposed to women, again, female side to always be behave a certain way. So in other words, you cannot be a man that doesn't fit the stereotypical, phenotypical, external, aesthetic presentation, okay? Because otherwise, you're not a true man. So you need to come out with a different term. This in itself is very repressive. It's very judgmental. It's very backwards if you think about that. So many make this claim that if in other areas, uh, the research, the current research, because things can change, the current research seems to indicate quite clearly that things such as uh, homosexuality, um, so homosexual preference and predisposition, is indeed genetically predisposed, so you're born that way, uh, and there, there are a variety of, of, of um, uh, claims as to why that is the case. You know, for instance, different exposure to testosterone. Um, that means that, first of all, it's not just a question that you can change, but the fact that you cannot be expected to behave and look just like every other man, all right? For instance, I don't know, uh, think about having long hair. I used to have long hair when, when you know, my <laughs> my hair still permitted it when I was in uh, high school and I used to play in heavy metal bands. Um, but think about, historically speaking, uh, barbarians. Again, it's, it's a eh, 
endonym that's used to make fun, so to speak, of a lot of uh, uh, ethno-cultural groups in Europe. But think of barbarian as in Germanic or Celtic tribes coming and and and, and messing up with the Roman Empire. They tend to have long hair, uh, men, uh, biological, phenotypical, identity-based men. Did that make them more of a woman or something in between in the eyes of the Romans? Of course not. And the Romans cut their hair because it was more uh, efficient in battle. Nobody could pull you from your hair, and therefore it was more uh, effective. Other things that are completely not based in science is preference for color. Does blue have to do with masculinity and pink with femininity? Of course not. But there are things that are indeed, behaviorally speaking, just external manifestation of, of biology. For instance, men, as in boys, tend to prefer playing with cars playing with things, and uh, females, girls, tend to prefer playing with girls. But of course, there can be an overlapping element there. This does not create a third gender. It does not create a spectrum. It does not create anything but normal variation between the two genders and or the two sexes. One more thing we might want to say, just to be mindful of the time here. So, all right. But does this really mean that um, we understand that Expecting men to be only one way, women to be only one way, is repressive. And that's why claiming that something is a spectrum simply means removing the freedom of a man to behave and dress up as he would prefer, and a woman to behave and dress up, and many other elements, okay? I'm just making these two cases to, to, to simplify things, as she would prefer, okay? So this is entirely opposite to the claim of uh, tolerance and inclusion, but what, are, what about certain claims that, um, in this sense, the left side seems to have a much better understanding at first than the right wing side? In the end, it's not about politics, but we start this conversation by saying that it is wrong to claim that every person is either XX or XY, but it does not change the binary. What about claims that, well, there is a difference between a real quote unquote woman and let's say a trans woman or the opposite, that real man, it's different than a trans man. Yeah? Now, for the sake of time, I will not delve into all the different um, parts of the acronym and all the different manifestations. So I, I will put everything in the same basket. You know, please bear with me. This is a summary, right? And uh, some of, the, of these things are, are taken from etymology, from, from uh, biology, um, and from the intersection, not intersectionality, which is also a, a quite uh, dubious attempt to make things clearer in science, um, but intersection between uh, clear scientific biological data and proper cognitive theoretical interpretation. And this can, uh, in this sense, um, I'm no longer quoting the 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 the, the works that I mentioned earlier, um, but um, perhaps uh, Bogardus will be one of the, the names that you, you might want to, to review. Uh, so if the question is, uh, should we consider trans women the same way as we consider women, if the consideration is predicated upon tolerance and understanding, of course, yes, full stop. We shouldn't discriminate if against anybody, if discrimination means any type of hate, hateful speech, hateful treatment, hateful uh, demeanor. Of course not. This is where the mistake is, though. We should not do this because there is an interesting difference in uh, ontological category, but because those are people, we should not hate anybody, period. In this sense, we're talking about true inclusion, true diversity. Creating artificial separation is simply false. It's an untruth and a very dangerous one because it would lead what would happen if you're going from praying the gay away, as we witnessed in the recent past, to trans the gay away, where a person is no longer able to exist the way he or she feels in connection with the body, but it has to abide by a certain type of ideology that wants to create an entire new category, which is contrary to the well-being of the person, okay? Again, how do I know that a person is mistaken? Because we can also see, neurologically speaking, in the activation of all this area that we mentioned, the fact that a person feels threatened by, for instance, society could mean that society is threatening, 
But based on our current understanding, it's much more sensible to think that it's an overarching activation of those very areas that we just mentioned, the bad nucleus of the stress terminalis, the, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the cortisol level that makes a person overactive, overreactive to things that otherwise should not be perceived as threatening, all right? So should we accept these people as, um, as, as in nurturing, inclusive, um, um, loving ways? Of course we should. It does not mean that we should go with their claims because those claims are not true. But most importantly, even more than true, you could say from the perspective of, of clinical intervention, they will not help them. So if the question is, is a trans woman a real woman? Now we have to think about, okay, what do we mean by that? There are a variety of ways to interpret that, biological, social, um, prescriptive, something uh, someone would say, uh, postmodernist, abolitionist, nihilistic ways. Um, I would say that as far as the biological standpoint, it's a pretty clear cut answer. No, trans women are not women, period. No doubt about it. Uh, sex is binary, period. There's no, there's no way around it. And um, plus, there's a prime application to it, which is very concerning, especially because of what we witness nowadays uh, in the younger population. Population, I would say, younger and younger at this point, age six and above, but could be even worse. So if biology does not exist, and, and in other words, it doesn't exist as a, a predictor of sexual binary, okay, why, why would someone transition? if sex did not exist as a biological, clear-cut, phenotypical and genotypical value, given everything we said about the variation in between processes and given the correct statistical interpretation, not just summing up all of them to understand the uh, prevalence in the overall population. So if the question is, is a trans woman a woman from a biological standpoint? No, this doesn't have to be uh, perceived as an attack. It doesn't have to be perceived as... Um, um, a backward or moralizing thing is just science. Uh, and um, and of course, I'm not suggesting we should become biologists in this uh, attempt. And that's why I'm not going to limit my analogy here only to biology, despite the fact that it's a very good place to start because it does not uh, require any moralizing, spiritualistic, philosophical interpretation. All right, but, but okay, biology. But at the end, we have to agree that people manifest themselves outwardly, if nothing else, the way they appear, right? I mean, we are not just our genes. We are the way we interact in the world. We can also make the case that we we are um, we are we are mirroring the reality outside of us. That's a wonderful um, um, little novel, little story by uh, Italo Calvino, an Italian and a writer, where. Um, there's a description of the world being outside of someone's window and the person is looking through the window outside and the world is looking back at the person. So the world exists on this side of the, um, of the window, but the world is also seeing itself through the eyes of the person. Now, this is, uh, you know, connected to a variety of things from in body cognition all the way to, um, uh, to quantum physics, you know, the, the usual cat whether, whether the cat is alive or not, according to Schrodinger. Uh, but, but the idea is that we're not just our bodies because our bodies exi exist in reality, exist in the world. So the social element makes a lot of sense. And it's also contrary to what we just said about the assumption that we are separate from society. So the fact that we have this expectation from society. So uh, what is a woman from a social perspective? Well, we talked about a woman is an adult human female in terms of the dictionary version of the facts and the biological version of the facts, okay? The presence or absence of, um, of the Y uh, chromosomes and the activation or deactivation of the SRY genes and other mutations, okay? From a social perspective, a woman is, you could say, someone who uh, is appearing, is behaving, functions, or even is treated a certain way in society as a woman, okay? Now, this is already a problem because it, it, it's circular thinking because it defines the woman based on the fact that people recognize you as such, which is actually predicated by biology because in most cases, with some exception in the case of uh, prosopagnosia and the inability to recognize uh, upward faces, 
It takes only a few seconds for anybody to recognize whether a face is a woman or a man, even if the face is uh, either shaven or artificially with Photoshop removing the hair, uh, facial hair or, or any type of hair. So this is also related to the fact that uh, social function has to be linked with social acceptance and self-acceptance again connected to dissatisfaction dysphoria so a claim can make can, can be made well if you don't accept yourself as you are why should i accept you now this might appear very callous at first very um um uh, hateful and in some cases it is hateful we shouldn't we shouldn't thread lightly about these things there are things that are done in order to provoke a negative uh, outcome and done out of uh, pure hatred we should not be uh, tiptoeing around the problem but the idea is that going back to what we said about the surgery or about suicidality i'm not trying to tell you that you're not good as you are you are good as you are and the fact that there is a mismatch between your identity and what you present could be a biological reason and in that sense there are completely different ways to interpret quote-unquote unquote true sexual pseudodimorphism or partial dimorphism including disorder sex development which in the past was simply identified as transsexual the fact that something exists that makes a person that way as opposed to a facade not facade in a negative sense but the way a person manifests themselves outwardly um and this by the way could also be viewed as a right-wing claim um because this is something to do with the, the appeal to authority, the fact that you want to be on the quote unquote right side of history. So I already mentioned the issue of, of, of projecting our values elsewhere. Okay. And, um, and, and think about, um, uh, think about um, how we can apply racism, for instance, to, to cultures that are, outside of the spectrum of historical understanding example etymologically speaking most um italic most romance languages uh, will define the term black likeness with a compound etymologically based word that stands from nigger niger negro negro nero okay and you have niger you have nero um but the idea that using that term in the United States, specifically in the Anglo-Saxon world, is racist, should be considered as such in this context. In other words, you can't really make a claim that if you use that N-word, you know, in, in, a, in a public university in the United States, you're really talking about the Romance etymology of it. No, you have to be careful and respectful of the fact that certain things are triggering. But to assume the fact that the term itself is an absolute racist term really is in itself a racist claim because it makes every other language which is not really anglo-saxon in, in, in nature and not even that just english modern english um unable to use the very terms that are predicated upon their etymology by the way if you want to use the term black etymologically speaking black is actually related to white to bleach as, as in you can be burned like from from bleach for instance okay? and there's plenty of other uh example in in, in this sense um so um or, or the same thing to, to to claim that um when you talk about the I mentioned this before we talk about um the um prevalence of uh American culture and you don't want even to consider the, the three biggest American cities so Sao Paulo in Brazil Mexico City Mexico and Lima Peru uh, so well you know and you don't even know that Mexico City is in North America. Well, you, you might want to not just study some biology, you want to study a little bit of um, etymology and just some basic geography that might be helpful. Um, to, by the way, talking about um, talking about um, um, uh, the, the this idea of social understanding of, of uh, in this case, womanhood, it's only predicated upon else from me, about the diversity from me, about something that's outside from me. Um, and um, and this is connected to the fact that, well, it's, we already say it's circular because you don't really provide a definition of a woman and the same claim can be made for men. 
But what, what if it's a question of freedom? It's um, uh, self-identification. Uh, a woman is anybody who identifies as, as one. Well, again, the problem is the same. You have a circle of thinking because the value, it's not contained by the term itself. It's not descriptive. It's not even tautological because the term, it's not a conceptualization term. And so the, the expectation is that I want you to treat me the way I want to be treated, but you don't make any of this claim in any other areas. For instance, you cannot claim to uh, to identify yourself as anything but what people identify you as. Despite the fact that sometimes this is really, really uh, problem-inducing. Example, um, throughout history, you have um, example of the fact that uh, there is a huge difference between exonym and endonym, between the way people sees and call themselves within the group and what people out of the group call themselves. And some of these terms are indeed uh, um, taking on or took on racist and negative connotation. But you have no control over that because you are, you cannot control what another person is saying. Now, this is not to say that we should not be mindful of that in society to make the world a more inclusive world. But uh, for instance, uh, we could make the case that as we said so far, and we, as we observed so far, the external label is much more connected to true science, to biology, to empirical knowledge than other terms that are related to, for instance, um, processes or academics. And yet we don't make the claim for academics. For instance, if I want to identify myself as a doctor, but I don't have a doctoral degree, then I cannot expect you to call me one because this will not be the truth. It will also not be good for me. Um, this doesn't mean that I have the freedom to act as, in this case, as one in the context of, for instance, a ritual, a theater piece, a performance, of course, as long as I don't believe this to be the case, because again, this is a circular term. And that's why it's really unhealthy uh, what transgender ideology is doing, especially toward a uh, true transgender individual, true transsexual individual, where we do have the scientific prevalence, sorry, there's a typical uh, um, um, observable fact that there are variation in level chromosomes, gonads, hormones, genitalia, et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, so th this view is also wrong. And um, we could also make this case, um, well, how about, how about we just got rid of, of gender as a construct altogether, assuming that it is a construct? Well, the, the point is that, um, when when a person makes this claim, which can be either viewed as a nihilistic claim, postmodernist, um, abolitionist, uh, if you claim that gender is completely sort of constructed, then first of all, this is a very, um, I would say it's homophobic, and it's also, um, uh, to, to a very big extent, is really um, anti-feminist, and anti, anti women really. It's really uh, feminophobic, you would say. Uh, because if you say that gender do not exist, you can make the claim that men don't exist and women don't exist. Do, they don't have any any intrinsic value, even more so than even have any existing ontology. They do not exist as a category. After all the work that uh, the first wave feminism did for human rights to be recognized, for instance, in the context of voting, you really are destroying all the uh, appropriate work that the first wave feminism did uh, throughout uh, the history of humanity. So it's, it's very it's a very sexist uh, thing to do, um, and 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 the other thing is is every time you create these pseudo neologisms, uh, first of all, yet again you don't know what you're talking about because you don't have the knowledge of the language, the basic knowledge to de determine how you create a word. Words are not just created randomly. Uh, unfortunately, this is more prevalent in the English world, I would say, where you can come up with really, in my mind, you know, stupid examples such as a smartphone. This doesn't make it's, it's, it's what is it like an intelligent voice, an intelligent sound? Um, just because you mix two things together, you, you, you're completely missing the way etymology actually works. How you, you you create a word based on the etymology, the stem, the prefix, and the suffix. But aside from that, um, you're 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 missing the fact that you might misinterpret. You must interpret what science is telling you, and this could give you a false sense of power, as in, yes, I do understand that biology says this and that. I do understand that throughout history that was the case, but we need to change because we have the power to change, and we need to be empowered by creating new things. 
And a person might say, well, actually, this doesn't make sense to me. Uh, and some, some of these people might have a very negative agenda. They want to make fun of people. They want to be uh, displaying hateful, homophobic, um, back backwards, um, hateful, I already said it, <laughs> hateful uh, understanding of reality. But in some cases, they just want to understand. They say, well, sorry, but biology is pretty straightforward. It has been straightforward for decades, and even more so because the more we study, the more we do understand that men and women are very different. Well, you know, in, in the context of, of statistical relevance, they're, they're 1.5% different between each other. So there's the, the, there's much more <clears throat> of a um, genetic um, similarity between, let's say, a man from Burkina Faso and a man from um, Luzatia than there is between a man for a, a woman from Burkina Faso and a man from Burkina Faso, or a man from Uzatia and, and, and a female and a woman from, from Uzatia. So it, it, the difference are very, very straightforward, um, which is not to say yet again that's a difference in hierarchy. But if you want to make amniologies, the issue is that, well, really transgender ideology is somewhat like contemporary art. And I think I have some inside knowledge about contemporary art because before my, <clears throat> my academic path toward neuroscience, medicine, um, and psychology I actually actually study um, visual and performing arts. So I think I'm, I'm quite versed in that, and I have huge admiration for arts and all its manifestation, including contemporary art. But uh, some of this this attitude within the transgender um, ideology movement is it's very similar to contemporary art. Um, the claim is that some of these concepts are so profound and 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 philosophically complex that you, you you just won't understand. Well, the truth is that you you did this installation because you are just a bad painter and you didn't have the skills to do that. In other words, there's a huge difference between uh, the, uh, I don't know, conceptual depth of, I, I, I don't know, even people like Matthew Barney, for instance, the Cree Master Cycle, or, or I don't know, Olafur Eliasson, or um, Andre Dragan, wind photography, or uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and I'm not even going to mention because I don't want to publicize the, the pseudo artists that really makes themselves important, but they're just not that profound. They just want to appear profound, uh, but they don't have, really have any either um, artistic skills or uh, capacity for uh, profound philosophical uh, or conceptual understanding of, of their art. In, in that case, removing genders is actually doing a disservice to the very community we're supposed to serve. Um, all right, so one one possible counter argument might be okay. So there is a risk uh, in getting rid of gender as a construct because it is a construct in my mind, not in my mind, but in the person making this claim. So we should just we should just um, act in a nurturing way, in tolerant way. So wh why bother? trying to force all these things in categories, in binary categories. Well, first of all, because it's not true. We're not bothering to do that. Nature will do it for us. History will do it for us. It's already done. But assuming for a second that this is indeed a just a social construct, one could make the claim that, well, we should at least speak and act as if trans women are women, trans men are men, because that is ethically justified to remove uh, hateful speech and remove um, violence against transgender individuals, which does happen. Of course, it does happen. And violence is never justified. It's, it's, it's stupid. It's evolutionary speaking dumb. It's ethically wrong and morally absurd. So you can make the case, well, at, at least, at the very least, working using this term, you work pretending that, there, uh, that a spectrum exists and trans women are women is ethically justifiable because the ultimate purpose is law, care, inclusion, diversity, and tolerance. You can make the claim. And yet you don't know really your history if you make the claim. Well, first of all, the assumption is that if you didn't do that, then the world were collapsing to hate and violence. The world is constantly collapsing under the weight of uh, hate and violence, unfortunately. We don't seem to learn from the past or for the future, for that matter. We seem to be doomed to repeat our mistakes. I'm not really that... Uh, apocalyptic in my views. I hope uh, I don't have this kind of um, cognitive distortion according to which I see the, the future as bad and the, and the past as good or the other way around. Um, but pretending that there is no truth will not serve the point, will not make the world a better place. And why is the case? Well, there's a variety of assumptions here. For instance, let's start from assumptions that this time the left, extreme left wing would make 
against uh, traditionalism, against uh, conservatism, namely the fact that, let's use the United States, the West, uh, we are heirs of a culture that is predicated upon a hateful, patriarchal, hyper-religious, conservative, repressive power that destroys anything on the spectrum. It destroys anything that is remotely malleable in the definition. This part of it would just demonstrate the opposite. It's actually the, the, uh, the, the very core of transgender ideology, the fact that people have to be feeding to LGBTQ, etc. But let's assume that this is true. Uh, if we really push that argumentation a little too far, um, a little too far, it's always too far because it's not breaking on reality, but we push it to obtain a, according to the Socratic method, right, a meiotic um, result, we could say, well, this is entirely predicated upon the repressive nature of, let's say, monotheistic culture. So definitely Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, possibly Zoroastrianism, the Druze, we don't really know, but it's definitely a repressive, hyper-religious thing that, that just wants to destroy and hate uh, reality as a spectrum. Uh, so you might argue, so do you have any other any other ways to, to determine what other cultures are more nurturing? 